Hello, Aaron. Well, hello how there. You, how are you doing, my friend? I am well. Thanks for asking. How are you? It, I'm doing good. It has been a it has been a few years, hasn't it? I suppose it has. <laughs> time, well, I'm gonna time, say the <laughs> time flies when you're having fun. Yeah, I could sit there and say this. I think my daughter was maybe six months old, I think, when we uh last done our podcast, and now she's five, so <laughs> yes, it's what what twenty seventeen probably. Yeah, yep, yeah, right yeah. around there. Yep. Yeah, yep. Easily. So somewhere around there. We'll just say we'll say many moons ago. How about that? Yeah, many moons. Lots <laughs> lots gone on. Lots has lots has gone on and happened in the world since then. Oh man, has it and has it not? Mm-hmm. Has but it, here we are. It's done some flips. It's done some cartwheels. No doubt. <laughs> and and we're just along for the ride. That's it. That's all we can do. Are we in the passenger? Because we're definitely not driving it, right? Mm. <laughs> Funny you say that. I just finished the uh, the new Gemini record, and one of the lyrics in one of the songs is, "I'm the I'm the driver and the passenger." What contradicting roles we play. <laughs> well, everybody uh, out here. Uh, you may not know this man as a martial artist. You may know him as a, the singer of Gemini Syndrome. He was one of the guitarists of Otep for a while. You have another side project. What's the side project that you're doing now? Called Wyote. It's with Wyote. Uh, Mikey Doling from Snot and uh, our friends over in Belgium, my Viking bros over there. It's been, yeah. been super fun, super fun trip with those guys over the last couple of years, getting this thing moving. Yeah, and it's actually uh, very interesting, too. Uh, if you guys uh, get a chance, check them out. Uh, check out everything that Aaron does. He's a very talented person. Well, thank you. Much more coming coming in the future as we move well, good. forward. But like I sit there and said, most people might not know you as a martial artist, but you're actually a Kung Fu practitioner. Yes, that is a, that is a true statement. Would that, would that be... Is it is it a practitioner when you're because I know there's like karate practitioners and then what is it if you're doing kung fu? What would that be considered? Depends on the depends on the system. Um, in what I do, there's generally three levels. There's student, teacher, master. Okay. Um, and it's kind of one of those. They don't really do belt systems. They do uh, like we have them in the school, but I've never, I haven't received a sash since I got my yellow sash about 24 years ago. So we don't do like belt testing. You know what I mean? Um, it's, it's, it's very, it's a super traditional style. My teacher's very old school. Well, Aaron, before we uh, get into this, I ask the same three questions, no matter who you are, how and why you got into martial arts, what's martial arts doing in your life? Like as this moment, like, you know, what are, what are you doing with it? And then what's your plans for martial arts in the future? So, uh, yeah, if people didn't know, well, why would they know? Uh, we was planning on doing this podcast last week, but then you actually went out to see your seafood, correct? I did. Yeah, I was there uh, last Thursday through Monday, which I had yes. been able to visit with him in a... I'd seen him briefly a couple times. We hadn't spent any real time together since probably pre-COVID. So it was okay. nice to get out. See, so this actually kind of works because now it's fresh what? in the brain. Exactly. Kung Fu's I'm, fresh I'm right there. Living and I'm living it right now. <laughs> you are the adult grasshopper right now, I guess. Uh, I don't know if I can take the pebble yet, but <laughs> do my best. All right. So then on with the first question. How and why uh, did you get into martial arts? Uh so I suppose my journey with that was before actual martial arts. I started wrestling in junior high. Um, I was a, I was a relatively, I desired to be an athletic kid. I was really scrawny. Uh, I was pretty timid and I have uh, a visual impairment, right? So I wasn't very good at sports, but you didn't have to try out for wrestling. Uh, and my neighbor at the time was a couple years older than me, and he was on the wrestling team. And that was something we did for fun as he taught me what he learned. And then we fought all the time. I was born and raised in the Midwest. That's like what we do. You know what I mean? What do you guys do for fun? Oh, we fight, beat each other up. So 
uh with the albinism and whatnot i had uh i had some challenges in like public school and i was teased a lot and i had a really rough go of it and by the time i was about 13 or so um we were looking at alternatives to going to like high school and i met a guy named jude d'angelo who has since transitioned to the other place uh, and he was my advocate to the education board of illinois and he was also a fifth don in hapkido and he taught a version of therapeutic martial arts is what he called it. Um, he took a, a a real liking to me, and I I took a real liking to him. I, I called him Da, which is dad in Korean, until he died. And his goal for me was to, he said, when he met me, I, I looked at the floor all the time. I didn't make eye contact with anyone. I was real quiet, just real, you know, scared of the world at large. And I started training with him. And I I think I had a desire to do, you know, karate or something before that. But my mom was a little scared, right? She didn't want me doing football. She didn't want me doing anything I could get hurt in. But Jude, because it was therapeutic, he was able to convince her to, oh, okay, so it's going to help, right? He's not really just fighting. Uh, and I, I excelled at it. I, I loved it. I enjoyed doing it. I put in a lot of time with it. Uh, and a couple of years later, he, he black belted me. I got my first Don. And in those couple of years, there was a huge uh, shift in my confidence, in my, you know, just the way I carried myself, the way I dealt with people. And by that point, I was, you know, interactive and I was confident to some degree, even if it was false teenage bravado. But it, it was an improvement from where I had been. And also, just so people may not know your story or anything, um, you have a albinism is that what it, what would that be called i mean i don't want to sit there and albinism know, sit, albinism okay yeah. uh you know that's you know because <clears throat> he doesn't dye his beard he doesn't dye his hair that's that's his Correct. natural that's his natural look so how is it pronounced albinism albinism yeah albinism. You, could, you could say someone uh is an albino okay but i suppose that's frowned upon now it's not, is it's, it it's okay PC, it's not the pc way to call it right <laughs> And got an individual with albinism, I think is the is the proper term or whatever, but okay. it, is what, it is what it is. So it's a genetic uh a genetic trait, it's a recessive quality uh that stops the production of melanin in the body, which produces color. And it also uh affects your eyes, correct? Yes. Yeah. And you're, so, you're seeing things like that. And part of that is because of the melanin. So part of the retina is pigmented. Okay. And it's the part of the of part of the eye that controls 2020 to 2070 vision. Um, basically, when the eye receives information, it has to go through that part of the eye. And if there's since there's no pigment, that part of the retina just doesn't work. Like the rods and the cones in the eye don't develop in the womb. So there's no real corrective measures they can do. Um, on top of that, I have a, a stigmatism and nystagmus. So I have an irregular curvature of my cornea. And because of that, when the light goes through the lens to the retina, one, the retina is not working properly, and two, the light isn't going in directly to the retina. So the eyes shake to try to get the stimulus that they're looking for. Which and because there's not the pigments and things in there, it, is the pigments kind of like blocking certain lights and stuff? Is that is that? Oh, one yeah, of yeah, 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 yeah. So, you know, typically speaking, people with dark eyes um, handle sunlight better. Uh, hmm. than people with blue eyes, right? Uh, I don't have any kind of shielding for that. So my okay. eyes appear blue uh, on my on my birth certificate. It's actually violet. They were purple when I was born. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So super light sensitivity. Sensitivity. It comes. It's a, a condition called photophobia, which you would think is fear of light, but it's more of like a more of like an allergy to it. Uh, in certain conditions, light is actually like painful. Uh, prolonged time in the sun tires me out. Fluorescent lights make me super irritable, which is probably why my job consists of performing in dark clubs in theaters, you know, at night. So, when, you saying, a, when you get on a festival outside, you're like, come on, guys. Oh, now I just, I'm like, who put the albino in the sun at three o'clock in the afternoon? Come on, guys. Yeah. Like I said that at Blue Ridge a couple of years ago, got a good shuffle out of the crowd. It was rough, man. I mean, I've gotten like, I got, Years ago, we played a festival in Michigan called Dirt Fest, and we were playing at like sundown. 
or just before, and there was no shade on the stage. And I got like sun poisoning from it. I was sick for like six hours. Wow. So it's it's a real thing, right? It's a real yeah. deal. Um, despite that, I moved to California when I was 17 and then moved to Vegas six years ago. So you you make your own judgment on that. And the reason why I wanted to bring this up, guys, is not just because, you know, it's a it's actually a very interesting thing about Aaron, but it also kind of involves with your martial arts anyways. But please go back to uh, being the uh, uh, with the Aikido, please. You're you're 100 percent right about that. We will get into that more with the, the Kung Fu training. Um, yep. So about 16 years old, I think, is when I got my my first done in Hapkido. And then I was working with with Jude at this place called Taking Control. And it was like a a private practice for like mental health and and like BD kids. Um, and basically we got the kids that had been through the system and gone on every avenue that nobody could help. And they were like putting their hands up. So they came to us. And there's this guy named Eric Bowler, who was this big biker dude, huge beard, rode a Harley, um, like a total grateful deadhead. Uh, and he also worked there. Um, and he happened to be a Kung Fu practitioner. So we became friends. We were working together. And I'm, at this point, I was like 16, 17. And I'm a mentor for these kids who are only a couple of years younger than me, right? So it was an interesting experience. And we also taught the therapeutic martial arts to those kids as a means to like develop self-control, you know, emotional temperance and that kind of stuff. Um, Eric was one of the the coolest dudes I ever met, and I idolized him. Right, he was just a he was just a badass. Uh, I remember one time walking through the the mall. Uh, we were, we took the kids to, to like the arcade or something, and we were leaving. And there was these teenage kids coming in, and they said something to me. I don't remember what it was, but they were they were making fun of my my albinism or some shit. And he was walking in front of me, and he like he was a big scary dude, man. And he like barked at them like a pit bull. And I thought that it was like, what, what was that? Like fearless, you know what I mean? Because when that stuff would happen to me, I would just like shut up and take it, you know, until I would snap, which is one of the reasons I had to leave school at 13, right? Because I was getting in fights and I was getting super emotional and you can only take abuse for so long before something bad happens to somebody. Yeah. No matter what it is. I mean, it could right. be uh, your, your element that you have, you know, when I was a kid, I was a little bit chubbier kid there for a while, you know, and, you sure. know, or, you know, it depends on what, uh, what avenue of life you're in or, you know, uh, demographics that you're living in. There's always something that could be picked on. Correct. Absolutely. And back in the eighties, man, like there was a lot of people and still today this happens, but not as much, but people didn't even know what albinism was. Uh, one of the one of the big turning points for that was that movie Powder, where they used like not a real albino, and that that was a disservice to to people with my condition all over the place because I got that was just more fuel right for the yeah. for the abuse. Well, where's your magic powers, man? <laughs> uh, and you know the thing is, is is like what other countries uh, also is um, uh, like if you have albinism, and I'm, I know I'm going to say that wrong. Um, excuse me, my cat's jumping up on me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, you're actually hunted and they use them for rituals and stuff that's, too. That's so, I mean, true. Yeah, that's true. There's a funny story about Randy Bly from Lamb of God. Um, that I'll tell you in a second, remind me. But yeah, in Africa, they're, they're hunted for, for medicine. They use their, our, our bones are believed to have magical properties. Uh, I don't know that that's true, but I hope you, you don't know. mind a cat sitting on my shoulder like a parrot. It's not sitting on my shoulder. <laughs> doesn't bother me none wouldn't care if he was but no i am not bothered um so yeah so i meet eric and i remember one of the first times we hung out uh at work and he was like all right so you're a black belt i'm a black belt we should be able to spar right and my ignorant kid mind was like yeah i should be able to hang with you and it was at that moment when I touched hands with him for the first time that it occurred to me that I had a black belt and could not fight. <laughs> and that was a problem, but they're two different styles too. Right. Cause you said he was a country with, with, without a doubt. Yeah. He was yeah. trained by my Sifu him and, and we'll all get to that in a second. Uh, they grew up together and they were friends. Right. Um, but I was fascinated by this and his Kung Fu was amazing. Like this guy was, he was a big, you know, kind of big dude. Uh, about my height, but like 
220 and I was probably weighing it at about a buck 30 but he moved like a cat and he was like so insanely powerful um and I'd seen him spar some dudes and he was he was just an incredible an incredible artist he really really embodied the the art so to say and shortly after that Manuel Rodriguez my Sifu came to visit and do a seminar and he so Sifu is a, an anomaly he is uh he's kind of he's like gifted with with kung fu and martial arts in general he's got black belts in taekwondo he's got honorary black belts in aikido uh he's got black belts in different types of karate jujitsu he's a master of i think seven different styles of kung fu uh he trained silver medalists in the olympics back in the 80s uh so he's a world-renowned coach and then he was also uh if you're familiar with the, the cartoon avatar the last airbender uh, he was the model's uh, style for Toph, the, the blind character in that, which is where this vision thing comes in. So him and this guy, Sifu Kisu, Kisu was the choreographer for that show, and they needed this obscure style for a blind character, and they called Murphy in, and he came in. So he comes out to my school, and he does this demonstration. And uh, again, like he he was doing things I just couldn't comprehend and just had a knowledge of of these arts that was very apparently like above and beyond the norm and and i kind of like fell in love with him i thought he was awesome he's this real big big dude uh very deceiving right and there was there was points where he had like he had gained quite a bit of weight and he was uh not in great health but he could still move like he weighed 140 pounds and he still can um he's 65 now so I ended up going to visit him uh, in California. And in the meantime, I was hanging out with Eric all the time. And Eric was like my first teacher, right? But he was non, he was trained traditionally, but he was like, uh, how do I say this? I guess bluntly, he was like a, he was a hippie, man. He smoked a lot of weed and his, his, his attitude towards things like he, he didn't have the mind that would retain forms in, in the way that some people do, but he internalized the conceptual parts of the systems, right? And it could apply them uh, in a way that, you know, somebody who maybe knows a hundred forms or 10 forms or whatever, maybe can't apply it in real life. Like this dude was the real deal. Mm -hmm. And Sifu had trained him. They grew up together in the Midwest outside Chicago. They grew up in like the sixties and seventies. And like, all they did was fight and go out and get in fights for fun. So this, this stuff was like street tested, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Manuel, Sifu Manuel was the first non-Chinese to learn the system of Southern Praying Manus that he teaches, that I study. It's called Chu Ka Tonglong. He learned from a guy named Sammy Wong, who was uh, involved with the Tong in Chicago. He was a, a, he was a very feared and respected dude. Uh, and he eventually was one of the hundred living treasures of China. Um, and embrace Sifu and pass the system on to him. Him and two other people were, were the only people allowed to officially teach it from him. Um, and one, only one of those guys was Chinese. So it was like really this, this change in the paradigm from the, the Chinese culture as they sort of embraced these outsiders, so to say. So I moved to California. I went and visited a few times. I loved it in California. And I found out that the, the driving restrictions for people with low vision were a little less strict or a little more forgiving in California. And so I wanted to go see if I could be independent and have a car. And I did. So I moved to California when I was 17 and basically lived with Sifu for about eight months, uh, training like six days a week, eight hours a day, 